I uh, have been getting advised by one of the folks on the uh, staff there uh, and actually took a trip up there and visited and learned a lot of really interesting things, just how they're actually selling firewood. So they're in the black. So they're a self-sustaining, autonomous, self-regulated community. They're considered transitional. So they're given about two years to stay there. And then folks have to leave. Um, but it was just really cool to go up there. They have community gardens. They have a woodworking shop. Um, it was, you just got the sense that it was home for a lot of people. And the folks that I did speak to up there uh, expressed that sentiment too. So that really got me thinking, like, why can't we think about creating something similar down here? Uh, on the right is Opportunity Village. Uh, I just love this quote. They're also called a transitional micro-housing community. Opportunity Village was a stepping stone for my transition back into society. After only a few months of living there with my girlfriend, uh, and I are now living a life we're able to sustain a home on our own after being homeless for two years. So again, it just provided that community and infrastructure for them to get out of homelessness. There's a lot of really cool innovation here in San Francisco. Uh, Baba May, Hand Up, the Pit Stop, really cool things. The other thing I wanted to bring up was just this idea of uh, uh, parklets. I think it's really cool that the city kind of just started testing out something new, and residents were receptive to it, and um, what, what started out as this like kind of grassroots movements where a bunch of guys were kind of like, we're gonna reclaim parking spaces, and we're just gonna set something up, and we're gonna pay the meter all day, and we're gonna say like, why can't we turn this uh, parking space into something other than what's used for a car? Um, was incredibly refreshing, and now our entire city is littered with these wonderful parklets. Um, and so, again, I'm just thinking in that mindset when I approach this project in terms of being innovative and thinking about alternatives to help you know correct the problem that we're currently in. This other kind of intersection that I want to kind of conclude with is this is driven by the tiny house movement. Um, and really what I think is most important there is that space is becoming harder and harder to come by. There's more and more debt. It's harder to get a mortgage. A lot of folks these days uh, live in tiny homes and they're wealthy and they have uh, you know, the means to buy larger houses, but they want to downsize. And so you know, a lot of kind of naysayers say, hey, there's these tiny homes. You know, why, do you, why do you want to put homeless people into like, you know, large dog houses, coffins, and you know, it, it's, it, it could be valid, but my, my kind of response to that is, you know, living in a tiny home is actually a dignified solution, and there's a lot of people staying in tiny homes who, who choose to do that. So um, I see it as, again, a totally reasonable option that's, that's not subhuman really in any way. There's been two guys who have done it really well. This guy, Elvis, in LA raised like 80 grand on Kickstarter, and I, you know, he, he rolled out a whole bunch of these. Uh, same with Greg, he's right here in Oakland. He rolled out a whole bunch of these and then quickly got into issues with like uh, public works and the city kind of like just seeing these things erupt and being flo uh, kind of floating all around the street. And so again, our solution is reacting to that and kind of saying like, all right, like, do we want to just have these tiny homes kind of floating all around the city or do we want to think a little bit more cohesively and strategically about it? So the other key component, uh, the map on the left, again, kind of hard to see, but all the blips are underutilized land, either residential or commercial vacant plots of land. Uh, we have a few different kind of uh, maps and heat maps like this that say that uh, there's actually quite a few opportunities where developers are kind of uh, dragging their feet. They're not uh, slotted to break land for like another two years or so. Why can't we use that land and uh, you know, kind of potentially think about uh, providing uh, housing solutions that are very short term? How are we doing on time? I just want to make sure we're not. All right, we're about to the way through. Um, the other really funny thing was just this idea of like, hey, uh, vacant lots are being turned into urban farms and residents are being given tax breaks to do that, right? So like, if, if we can use our vacant lots for urban farms to help the community, why can't we help the homeless community with vacant lots? Yeah, yeah, cool. So here's my very, very, very poorly drawn Venn diagram that I put together very quickly. I apologize. There's an intersection point in there somewhere. It's a little bit hard to see, but St. Francis Village is at that intersection of 
kind of what I just took you through, which is tiny home movement, the fact that we're in a state of emergency and have an opportunity to innovate, the fact that the shelter system is broken and it needs to change, this idea of the navigation center being successful, but potentially can be evolved, um, and then uh, taking advantage of underutilized land. So that brings us to St. Francis Village. Uh, this is a preliminary rendering. I'm actually working with an artist to do some more professional renderings, but the idea uh, I'll take you through here in a little bit. So the idea of St. Francis Village mission um, to develop and pilot sleep and service villages for 10 and house residents that provide a minimum of secure sleep, 24 access to toilets, storage, trash disposal, site coordination, and partnered connection to case management for each person staying at the community. The reason why we think it's really important is because it provides dignity, autonomy, and opportunity. Those are the kind of key things that we want to focus on it providing. The way we want to achieve that is through fostering kind of a, a tiny home community where folks get to make their own decisions about how it's run uh, by making sure that everyone who's in the program has a case manager to help them in their transition from the streets to this village into permanent housing. Uh, we plan to provide restroom, storage, showers, and trash so that's a healthy living environment. Uh, and of course, uh, we want it to be Really, when I say longer term, you know, around uh, anywhere from six months to two years, uh, so that people aren't like they are now, kind of moved around uh, day to day, uh, cited for uh, violations, ticketed and fined and criminalized for being homeless. Uh, so here's a quick budget. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You guys take a photo, or uh, this is our uh, uh, our base amount, which is essentially pretty close to five grand to get the project started. Um, this would, most of the salary would be going to the on-site coordinator to kind of be uh, managing uh, the environment there and managing folks who are living there. Uh, and then as you can see, case management is the most crucial part, but it is, uh, doesn't have a line item, and that's because we're in talks and partnering with local nonprofits who would be uh, basically providing those case management services. The porta potties and garbage and recycling, you know, are kind of obvious. So um, the one time, though, and by the way, those were the uh, monthly costs. The um, one time setup cost uh, between six and 9,000, really 6,000, 9,000 if we wanted to do solar uh, to have some kind of electricity, we found that Charging devices like phones are, are really crucial, so we wanted to put it on there, but it depends on fundraising. Uh, so I actually have, I didn't include a picture, but I built uh, one of these units uh, with supplies from Home Depot for $200. Uh, and it's built um, off of pallets, so we're kind of getting those pallets uh, donated, and then we're using kind of minimal materials. Uh, and we've been able to create these housing solutions for extremely cost-effective uh, rate. And they're you know, waterproof, they're lockable, they have a window. Uh, you know, the one I have now has like a fold-down desk, so very livable and sleepable. Uh, you can't stand up in it. Really, it's meant for you know, uh, sleeping. Um, you know, if you want to change in it, if you want to use the desk, maybe. But you know, it's fairly small. Um, so just kind of where we are in terms of the actual pro um, project. Uh, we've been working closely with the city. We realize that that's really important. We just met with the Department of Planning. Turns out that there's specific zones that in San Francisco will only allow for housing. So we were kind of, uh, on, I'm sorry, sheltered uh, and homeless housing. So originally we were reaching out to landowners kind of all over San Francisco, just approaching them, um, you know, cold calling them. But if they're not in, an area that's zoned for homeless shelters, that became an issue. So we've just been making sure that everything is kind of buttoned up in terms of how we um, approach this and collaborate with the city. So we realize that the city's not on board, it's going to be really difficult to launch. Um, you know, this is my appeal to say, if you know a vacant plot of land uh, that might be a possibility, or you know somebody who would be potentially interested in getting a tax break for donating uh, a plot of land that they have, um, we can talk about size and other requirements, um, but that is 
uh, phase that I'm currently in, in terms of searching for a viable option uh, to do this. Um, we've been doing a lot of community outreach. We've been doing talks in other neighborhoods to kind of understand how this could potentially work. And there's obviously a lot of concerns with, with residents around safety. Um, but those, again, are things that I feel like once we've started to really have discussions uh, with neighbors and, again, start to let people understand those issues and how a lot of these folks are neighbors and people who have lived here in San Francisco, that alleviates a lot of the, um, a lot of the issues that we've, we've been running into. Um, then we're doing, obviously, fundraising and partner development. Uh, eventually, we'd like to look at these uh, villages and say, hey, this is just a pilot project, but you know, is it possible to scale it up and actually provide solutions? So if there are literally right now 3,000 folks who are sleeping on the street every night, what would it take in terms of space requirements? You know, like, let's say we had a village closer to Dignity Village where there was 50 people, um, and we were able to get them into something where they had safe sleep uh, for you know, an interim time while they were looking for permanent housing. Uh, and, uh, so I guess the, the the thought there is, you know, do we want to have like hundreds of these with only ten people in it, and how difficult would that be to manage? Versus if we kind of scale it up and have a larger number of uh, people. And one of the findings with the navigation center is once you get over kind of like sixty people or so, things just start to kind of become. It's like a, a tipping point where things just become like a more disjointed community. Everyone doesn't know everyone. Voting and meetings become more difficult. So, again, just the learning that I've come across. Um, and then uh, I, I think this is kind of the last slide. Just kind of this idea of like, well, what's the the longer term vision here? And this is uh, a really interesting um, one for me too. Which uh, so so yeah, we obviously if we have permanent housing, that's ideal. That's what we all want. We all want permanent housing, but that's going to take a long time to build. Uh, we don't have funding at the federal level, so, you know, like, what's Jerry Brown doing? Why don't we have federal funding to do this? Um, so that's that's a question we should all be asking of our uh, state and federal government. Um, how can we uh, kind of think about this in terms of preventative measures? What do we do to keep folks from becoming homeless to begin with? Um, you know, for those people who have uh, addictions and mental illness, there's solutions uh, for, uh, you know, people who are experiencing poverty, there's other solutions. Um, this other idea that I've been exploring a lot lately is um, basic income. It's been gaining a lot of traction. Uh, does anyone here know what, what basic income is? Guaranteed income, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. It's like what Switzerland just turned down. Exactly, just turned so down. that sign is actually from the movement in Switzerland. Uh, it's in Alaska, the permanent fund is doing it, so every resident in Alaska currently receives, I think, $1,500 every year. Uh, and when you turn 65, you get Social Security. So what would our country look like if every resident received a basic income, and how might that be a solution to provide uh, you know, an answer to uh, income inequality and solving some of these poverty uh, issues? Uh, the two bottom pictures, uh, this guy Patrick Kennedy uh, runs an organization called The Panoramic. He's working with these uh, units that uh, snap together. They're micro units. I believe it's 165 square feet. It has a kitchen, a bathroom, a bedroom. Can you and stand up inside of it? I'm sorry? Can you stand up inside of it? Yes, you can stand That's up inside they're, they're totally legitimate apartments. They're a lot more expensive, but they could be an option for the city to fund that is uh, considerably less expensive than building traditional housing. Again, there's a whole bunch of issues, you know, like these are fabricated in China, and the unions don't want to use, you know, uh, products and labor that come. So we've been exploring, like, lots of alternatives and running up to challenges and obstacles in all different ways. But again, this is a really interesting idea. If you look at the picture on the right, this thing kind of snaps apart and snaps back together. So again, where we've been just exploring lots of different ideas and alternatives. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah, that's the last slide. So, sorry, I don't know if it wasn't too long, but I'd love to take questions. Okay. Five questions. Yeah. Susan? Yeah, um, is there a way of working with the HUD or something to allow 
people to allow people to move in with other people and like sign a waiver or something? You're talking about the shelter system. Well, well, the sh okay, the, the shelter system. You know, th no, this is just individual people um, can bring someone into their home for for, for temporarily. To, you know, because right now we've got this problem. As people are out on the street waiting to get into homes that you know they'll wait for three years, four years, mm -hmm. and you know where do they go? They, uh, where do they go while they're waiting for for a home? Mm -hmm. And I uh, think what she's trying to get at is that there are people, uh, there, are pe there are homeless people, and there are people that are housed, and they're not allowed to have roommates because the unit says only one person per unit, and these are HUD requirements or other kind of restrictions on that housing. So uh, I don't know if I can provide an exact answer to that question, but I know that there's legislation being explored uh, to uh, do things like, for instance, uh, garage conversions and how do we kind of get around traditional permitting. So like you could potentially convert a garage for 15K to make it into a livable unit, but current zoning and permitting requires you to spend you know, upwards of 150K. Yeah. Um, and well, so is, yeah. those are some of the things that we also kind of looked into. Another question really quick. How can a person get a case manager without signing up with somebody that wants to take all their money? What I mean is, what I'm saying except for $65 or whatever. I mean, people, you know, that are signing up with, signing up with some of these organizations, they say, we want to be able to control your money, you know, and just give you $65 a month or whatever, you know, and, um, and the care not cash, you know, it was, you know, a lot of people ran into trouble because they had these they had these things where you, you had you, you had to uh, you couldn't have less less rent than a certain amount of money or it was sort of like and, and there was no I mean none of these places in San Francisco you can get now for more than for less than a thousand a month so even if somebody has almost that money in disability, you know, like they might have $800, $900 disability, they still can't move into a place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've also read quite a few articles and, you know, have been trying to understand the system. And in a lot of cases, it's, it's cheaper to kind of um, not do things because you, for instance, if you get if you get a job, you'll lose your disability, and uh, mathematically, it actually just is more effective to stay on disability. So again, I agree that there's issues within the system that kind of need to be fixed. Uh, again, that's something I think that would come more, you know, at the ballot or on the legislative. Uh, okay, so uh, Gilbert had a question. Uh, actually, um, can you just, sorry, really quick, while we're taking some questions, go yeah. back to uh, several slides that think were of St. Francis Bell? Yeah. I just know I just can't have that. Oh, oh sure. I think that's the same thing. Yeah. Well, I was going to compliment you on a great presentation, but it's not, it's kind of short. And uh, the first category that you use for homeless people, they're mental, other criminals, or they're drug addicts, or whatever. You should ask the fifth to mention that they're veterans. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with veterans. I didn't mention veterans. At first you didn't, and then later on you mentioned that 20% were, were, were veterans. But, but I'm trying to inform you on what the situation is with the veterans. A lot of them are drug addicts, they're disabled and everything else, but, but the most, uh, most of them, 20% the of the homeless people, uh, is due to uh, bureaucratic deficiencies. You have to realize that it took the Veterans Administration or the U.S. government 60 years before they gave compensation to the Agent Orange veterans. Uh, the desert illness, the veterans are still fighting the Veterans Administration and the U.S. government for compensation for that. So there's a lot of homeless people out there that fit that category. The Gulf Storm illness, and then also now, the latest, uh, uh, the head trauma and the, uh, head trauma and the, 
like I said earlier. Yeah, PTSD and head trauma injuries. Uh, the Veterans Administration.